The Battle of Luz took place from the 25th of September to the 8th of October 1915 in France on the Western Front during the First World War. It was the biggest British attack of 1915, the first time that the British used poison gas and the first mass engagement of new army units. The French and British tried to break through the German defences in Artois and Champagne and restore a war of movement. Despite improved methods, more ammunition and better equipment, the Franco-British attacks were contained by the German armies, except for local losses of ground. British casualties at Luz were about twice as high as German losses. <inaudible> <inaudible> Background Strategic developments The battle was the British part of the Third Battle of Artois, an Anglo-French offensive known to the Germans as the Herbstschlacht Autumn Battle. Field Marshal Sir John French and Douglas Haig GOC First Army, regarded the ground south of Le Bassy Canal, which was overlooked by German-held slag heaps and colliery towers, as unsuitable for an attack, particularly given the discovery in July that the Germans were building a second defensive position behind the front position. At the Fravon conference on 27 July, Field Marshal French failed to persuade Ferdinand Foch that an attack further north offered greater prospects for success. The debate continued into August, with Joffre siding with Foch and the British commanders being overruled by Herbert Kitchener, the British Secretary of State for War, on 21 August. On 3 May, the British decided to use poison gas in military operations in France. At a conference on 6 September, Haig announced to his subordinates that extensive use of chlorine gas might facilitate an advance on a line towards Douai and Valenciennes, despite the terrain, as long as the French and British were able to keep the attack secret. <laughs> Prelude Topic: British offensive preparations. The battle was the third time that specialist Royal Engineer tunneling companies were used to dig under no man's land, to plant mines under the parapets of the German front line trenches, ready to be detonated at zero hour. Topic: <laughs> British plan. French decided to keep a reserve consisting of the Cavalry Corps, the Indian Cavalry Corps and 11th Corps Lieutenant General Richard Haking, which consisted of the Guards Division and the New Army 21st Division and 24th Division, recently arrived in France and a corps staff some of whom had never worked together or served on a staff before. Archibald Murray, the deputy chief of the Imperial General Staff DCIGS, advised French that as troops fresh from training, they were suited for the long marches of an exploitation rather than for trench warfare. French was doubtful that a breakthrough would be achieved. Hagen Fock, commander of the Groupe des Armées du Nord Northern Army Group, wanted the reserves closer, to exploit a breakthrough on the first day, French agreed to move them nearer to the front but still thought they should not be committed until the second day, Haig was hampered by the shortage of artillery ammunition, which meant the preliminary bombardment, essential for success in trench warfare, was insufficient. Prior to the British attack, about 140 long tons t of chlorine gas was released with mixed results, in places the gas was blown back onto British trenches, while in others it caused the Germans considerable difficulty. Due to the inefficiency of contemporary gas masks, many soldiers removed them as they could not see through the fogged up eyepieces or could barely breathe with them on, which led to some being affected by their own gas. Wanting to be closer to the battle, French had moved to a forward command post at Lilias, less than 20 miles 32 km behind the 1st Army front. He left most of his staff behind at GHQ and had no direct telephone to the 1st Army, which attacked at 6.30 am on 25 September, sending an officer by car to request the release of the reserves at 7 am. Topic Battle
Topic: The 25th of September. In many places British artillery had failed to cut the German wire before the attack. Advancing over open fields, within range of German machine guns and artillery, the British suffered many casualties. The British were able to break through the weaker German defences and capture the village of Luz en Goal, mainly due to numerical superiority. Supply and communications problems, combined with the late arrival of reserves, meant that the breakthrough could not be exploited. Haig did not hear until 10 a.m. that the divisions were moving up to the front. French visited Haig from 11 o'clock to 11.30 a.m. and agreed that Haig could have the reserve but rather than using the telephone he drove to Haking's headquarters and gave the order at 12.10 p.m. Haig then heard from Haking at 1.20 p.m. that the reserves were moving forward. Topic. 26–28 September When the battle resumed the following day, the Germans had recovered and improved their defensive positions. British attempts to continue the advance with the reserves were repulsed, 12 attacking battalions suffered 8,000 casualties out of 10,000 men in four hours. French told Foch on 28 September, that a gap could be «rushed» just north of Hill 70, although Fock felt that this would be difficult to coordinate and Haig told him that the 1st Army was in no position for further attacks. A lull fell on 28 September, with the British having retreated to their starting positions, having lost over 20,000 casualties, including three major generals. <laughs> Air operations. The Royal Flying Corps RFC came under the command of Brigadier General Hugh Trenchard. The 1st, 2nd and 3rd Wings under Colonels E. B. Ashmore, John Salmond and Sefton Branca participated. As the British were short of artillery ammunition, the RFC flew target identification sorties prior to the battle, to ensure that shells were not wasted. During the first few days of the attack, target marking squadrons equipped with better wireless transmitters, helped to direct British artillery onto German targets. Later in the battle, pilots carried out a tactical bombing operation for the first time in history. Aircraft of the second and third wings dropped many 100-pound bombs on German troops, trains, rail lines and marshalling yards. As the land offensive stalled, British pilots and observers flew low over German positions, providing target information to the artillery. <laughs> Aftermath Analysis <laughs> 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 Rawlinson wrote to the King's advisor Arthur Big the 28th of September From what I can ascertain some of the divisions did actually reach the enemy's trenches for their bodies can now be seen on the barbed wire Major General Richard Hilton at that time a forward observation officer said of the battle A great deal of nonsense has been written about Luz The real tragedy of that battle was its nearness to complete success most of us who reached the crest of Hill 70, and survived, were firmly convinced that we had broken through on that Sunday 25 September 1915. There seemed to be nothing ahead of us, but an unoccupied and incomplete trench system. The only two things that prevented our advancing into the suburbs of Lens were, firstly, the exhaustion of the jocks themselves for they had undergone a belly full of marching and fighting that day and, secondly, the flanking fire of numerous German machine guns, which swept that bare hill from some factory buildings in Sight Street August to the south of us. All that we needed was more artillery ammunition to blast those clearly located machine guns, plus some fresh infantry to take over from the weary and depleted jocks. But, alas, neither ammunition nor reinforcements were immediately available, and the great opportunity passed. The 12 attacking battalions suffered 8,000 casualties out of 10,000 men in four hours. 
French had already been criticised before the battle and lost his remaining support in the government and army due to the British failure and a belief that he handled poorly the reserve divisions. French was replaced by Haig as Commander-in-Chief of the British Expeditionary Force in December 1915. Casualties <coughs> 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 British casualties in the main attack were 48,367 and they suffered 10,880 more in the subsidiary attack, a total of 59,247 losses from the 285,107 British casualties on the Western Front in 1915. James Edmonds, the British official historian, gave German losses in the period the 21st of September to the 10th of October as c. 26,000 of c. 141,000 casualties on the Western Front during the autumn offensives in Artois and Champagne. In Der Weltkrieg, the German official account, 6th Army casualties are given as 29,657 to the 21st of September. By the end of October, losses had risen to 51,100 men and total German casualties for the autumn battle, Herbstschlacht in Artois and Champagne, were given as 150,000 men. Topic: <laughs> Subsequent operations. Topic: 3 to 13 October. The Germans made several attempts to recapture the Hohenzollern Redoubt, which they accomplished on the 3rd of October. On the 8th of October, the Germans attempted to recapture much of the remaining lost ground by attacking with five regiments around Luz and against part of the 7th Division on the left flank. Foggy weather inhibited observation, the artillery preparation was inadequate and the British and French defenders were well prepared behind intact wire. The German attack was repulsed with 3,000 casualties but managed to disrupt British attack preparations, causing a delay until the night of 12-13 October. The British made a final attack on 13 October, which failed due to a lack of hand grenades. Haig thought it might be possible to launch another attack on 7 November but the combination of heavy rain and accurate German shelling during the second half of October persuaded him to abandon the attempt. Commemoration The Luz Memorial commemorates over 20,000 soldiers of Britain and the Commonwealth who fell in the battle and have no known grave. The community of Luz in British Columbia, changed its name from Crescent Island to commemorate the battle and several participants wrote of their experiences. Robert Graves described the battle and succeeding days in his war memoir Goodbye to All That 1929. Patrick McGill, who served as a stretcher bearer in the London Irish and was wounded at Luz in October 1915, described the battle in his autobiographical novel The Great Push 1916, and J. N. Hall related his experiences in the British Army at Lose in Kitchener's Mob 1916. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Victoria Cross Awards. Daniel Laidlaw, 7th Service Battalion, King's Own Scottish Borderers. Frederick Henry Johnson, 73rd Field Company, Corps of Royal Engineers, 15th Division. Harry Wells, 2nd Battalion Royal Sussex Regiment. Ancatel Moutre Reed, 1st Battalion, Northamptonshire Regiment. Posthumous. Henry Edward Kenny, 1st Battalion, Loyal North Lancashire Regiment. George Stanley Peachment, 2nd Battalion, King's Royal Rifle Corps. Arthur Vickers, 2nd Battalion, Royal Warwickshire Regiment. George Mayling, Royal Army Medical Corps. Colbert Tarpa, 2nd Battalion, 3rd Queen Alexandra's Own Gurkha Rifles. Rupert Price Hallows, 4th Battalion, Middlesex Regiment. Angus Falconer Douglas Hamilton, 6th Service Battalion, Queen's Own Cameron Highlanders. Arthur Frederick Saunders, 9th Service Battalion, Suffolk Regiment. 
Robert Dunsire, 13th Service Battalion, Royal Scots. James Dalgleish Pollock, 5th Service Battalion, Queen's Own Cameron Highlanders. Alexander Buller Turner, 3rd Battalion, Royal Berkshire Regiment, Posthumous. Alfred Alexander Burt, 1 over 1 of a Stone Battalion, Hertfordshire Regiment. Arthur Fleming Sands, 2nd Battalion, East Surrey Regiment. Samuel Harvey, 1st Battalion, York and Lancaster Regiment. Oliver Brooks, 3rd Battalion, Coldstream Guards. James Lennox Dawson, 187th Company, Corps of Royal Engineers. Geoffrey Vickers, Sherwood Foresters, Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire Regiment. Topic. See also. Charles Sawley, John Kipling. Topic. Notes. Equals equals footnotes. <laughs>